Good morning. I'm Rosalie Schaefer, and on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Manatee County, I welcome you to our program today. Today, we are going to talk about something that is of great concern to all of us, health care, health insurance, Medicaid, Medicare. We're living in a time of fast and serious changes to our programs and how they are delivered. How are these changes affecting us? What patients are falling through the cracks? Is it even possible to provide reasonably priced health insurance for all? To help us understand these issues, we have with us some excellent experts on these topics. Patrick Cannon, who is the advocacy, advocacy director for the Florida chain, which stands for Community Health Action Information Network. <laughs> and we have uh, Jill Gass of We Care Manatee, which is a nonprofit group that helps these patients who are falling through the cracks. Gass. And healthcare attorney and lawyer um, and uh, author Jonathan Fleece who has recently published a book called The New Health Age, The Future of Healthcare in America. Our format today will be each speaker will speak for about 15 minutes on their topic, and then we will open the floor to questions from the audience. When we reach that point, please use the, oh, the microphone. Okay. The microphone on the uh, stand to ask your question and give your name before you ask your question. Okay, if with no further ado, let's get rolling. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Patrick Cannon, uh, and as uh, Rosalie said, uh, I'm advocacy director for Florida Chain, the Community Health Action Information Network. We're a statewide consumer health advocacy uh, group. We work to expand access to uh, health care to uh, all Floridians, and it's a pleasure uh, to be with you all today. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of the Affordable Care Act and a little bit about uh, where it stands uh, in Florida in terms of implementation. Uh, last year, Becky was diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, she uh, had gotten three months of treatment, and then she returned to work to learn that she couldn't get coverage anymore, and that they canceled her coverage. She went to 13 different insurance companies, and each of them told her the same thing, that we can't cover you because you have a pre-existing condition. Well, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, in 2014, adults will no longer be able, uh, will no longer be discriminated against uh, for having pre-existing conditions. So there's gonna be a thing called a guaranteed issue, and uh, it, all adults, can get coverage under the Affordable Care Act in 2014. Now currently children can no longer be discriminated against uh, for having pre-existing conditions. So they can get coverage now. Uh, adults it'll be in a 2014. Um, <clears throat> some other protections is that uh, you can't lose your coverage when you get sick. There are no lifetime uh, limits on coverage and uh, small businesses get tax credits to help pay for uh, health insurance uh, for their employees. So there are three main uh, points I want you to take away from today. Uh, the Affordable Care Act expands coverage. Uh, it offers new choices, protections, and benefits to consumers. And uh, it also makes health care uh, more affordable. Now, uh, I mentioned that adults will no longer be discriminated against for having pre-existing conditions in 2014. Uh, in the meantime, there's a transitional program called the Pre-Existing Condition Insurance Plan, or PCIP. It's a transitional plan that's in place right now until 2014, and uh, it offers insurance to adults who've been denied uh, because they had pre-existing conditions, and it applies to any pre-existing condition uh, regardless of severity. So it could be something like life-threatening, like cancer, or it might be something less severe, like asthma. It's basically, as long as you couldn't get coverage because you had that pre-existing condition, that's what the PCIP uh, is for. Uh, you basically have to be a U.S. citizen uh, or legally residing in the United States, you have to be uninsured for six months and uh, have a pre-existing condition or been denied one, uh, coverage because of that pre-existing condition. Now, it used to be that you had to have a note from your uh, insurance company 
saying that they denied you, now all you need is a, is a letter from your health care provider. And the rates have dropped uh, significantly since last July, um, about 40% in Florida. So a man of 50 could get coverage for about $270 a month now through the pre-existing condition insurance plan. Uh, and uh, if you want to get more information, the best place to go is PCIP.gov. So uh, <clears throat> in 2010, there was a new set of protections called the Patient's Bill of Rights. And those protections helped to end some of the worst uh, insurance company abuses. And I'm going to cover a few of those examples of people who, uh, who qualify or benefiting from that Patient's Bill of Rights. Karen here, both of her uh, parents had type 2 diabetes. So she wasn't surprised when her doctor uh, told her that she was pre-diabetic. But thanks to the Affordable Care Act, she was able to enroll in a prevention program through her community hospital, and she was able to keep her triglycerides and her, uh, her glucose levels down through exercise and diet, and she was able to avoid becoming diabetic. So the, free, uh, the Affordable Care Act provides free preventive services. Uh, you can't lose your coverage when you get sick. Women now no longer have to get a referral to see an OBGYN, and uh, Medicare now includes annual checkups and other free preventive services. Um, so there are a number of other things that the Affordable Care Act does to, to uh, improve Medicare. Uh, it will eventually close the donut hole in prescription drug coverage. So when you start paying thousands of dollars and all of a sudden you don't get any more benefits from Medicare, that hole will be closed. Currently, um, seniors on Medicare can get a 50% discount off their uh, name brand drugs if they fall into the donut hole. Um, Changes in uh, Medicare also include reining in Medicare Advantage plans. It's put Medicare on a more financial, uh, solid financial footing. And regardless of whatever you might have heard, there are no cuts to Medicare benefits. So Medicare benefits are, are the same. There's actually more and they're better. The cuts that you may have heard of actually apply to the bonuses that uh, Medicare was paying out to private insurance companies. So when you hear about Medicare cuts, really talking about just cuts to private insurance companies, not cuts in benefits. So benefits have not gone away. David here was covered for a year before his insurance company went back into his record and uh, retroactively canceled his policy. Uh, they said that he didn't claim all of the, uh, his health information on his application. Well, David didn't know that hemorrhoids were considered to be a uh, digestive disorder. Did anyone know that? <laughs> I didn't know that either. So they canceled his coverage. He, uh, they also said he didn't mention anything about his high uh, triglycerides, which he didn't even know he had. But they canceled his coverage anyway. He applied, uh, appealed the claim, and the insurance company said, sorry, no, we're not going to uh, cover you. Um, well, that sort of thing can't happen anymore under the Affordable Care Act. If you make an honest mistake on your uh, insurance application, an omission, something you didn't even know existed, they can't uh, cancel your coverage. Also, there's another level of appeal process. Once you go through your uh, insurance company's appeal process, then you, and if they deny your claim, you can go to another independent review board, and their decisions are not tied to the insurance company or any financial interest there. So it's a possibility to get a better shake out of, the, uh, out of that new appeals process. Kristen here from uh, Fort Myers, she was graduating from college. And what that meant was that she's no longer eligible for the student health plan. So she actually thought about enrolling in graduate school and paying thousands of dollars for classes just to stay on the student health plan, which if any of you have had college students, you know is really not complete coverage anyway, so it's not that comprehensive. That wouldn't be that great of a deal for Kristen. Well, fortunately, the Affordable Care Act, if you're under 26, you can stay on your parents' coverage. You don't have to uh, be living at home. You don't have to be a student. You can be married and have children. The only restriction on this uh, provision is that the insurer, uh, the employer, uh, can't be providing or make available insurance uh, to the employee. So if you have a job, you're under 26, and your employer provides insurance, you would not be eligible uh, to stay on your parents' plan. But otherwise, uh, you would be. So this is great for young adults. Uh, so young adults can stay on their parents' plan uh, as long as their uh, employer does not offer uh, insurance. Uh, <clears throat> Brian here is a small business owner. He's provided health insurance for his employees. 
Uh, but he worries every year, like a lot of us do, that these uh, premiums are going up 15, 20, 30, even some states 40 percent every year. Um, but thankfully, uh, the Affordable Care Act offers small businesses under 25 employees a 35 percent tax credit to help cover the cost of insurance. Um, the other requirement is that uh, the, the wage has to be uh, about an average of less than $50,000 a year. So under 25 employees and uh, under $50,000 a year for salary. Now, uh, when insurance companies pay money for your claim or they pay for health services, they have a term for it. It's called a medical loss. And the percentage of money an insurance company pays on care is called a medical loss ratio. Now, currently under Florida law, um, Jonathan, you might know, it's, is it 50, 60 percent required to pay out on claims? Um, and it's uh, under the Affordable Care Act now, insurance companies have to pay 80 percent or 85 percent if they're in the large group market. So they're going to have to pay more for care and less on CEO compensation and marketing and uh, other overhead costs that don't contribute directly to, uh, to health care. Now, in 2014 is when the largest uh, expansion of health coverage is going to happen in this country since uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Um, there are a number of big changes. Uh, one is that more people are going to qualify for Medicaid. Currently, the, uh, the limit is 100 percent of federal poverty, and in 2014, it's going to go up to 133 percent of federal poverty. Uh, and it's also going to include childless adults. Uh, currently in Florida, if you're a childless adult at 100 percent of federal poverty, you won't qualify for Medica uh, Medicaid because you don't have children. Uh, in 2014, employers are over 50 employees but not under 50. Over 50 employees, employers are going to have to help out with coverage or uh, pay a small uh, fine to make up for the fact that they're not providing coverage. And as I mentioned at the beginning, adults with pre-existing conditions um, can't be denied coverage in 2014. So that's going to expand coverage between the Medicaid uh, and employer, uh, employers helping and with adults not being denied coverage is going to expand coverage to about 30 to 32 million people. Now in 2014, a, a new way to shop for health insurance is going to happen. It's called the Exchange. There'll be a web portal that you can sign up for health coverage through this web portal. And what it is, it's a competitive, transparent uh, marketplace for insurance. It'll be kind of like a Travelocity or Kayak or Orbitz booking uh, travel. You just plug in the information that you want, uh, family members, uh, health conditions, certain things you want in the, uh, in the plan. And, uh, and it will like tell you where you can get uh, affordable coverage. And uh, if you can't afford the coverage and your family is at 400 percent of federal poverty, that's about $73,000 for a family of four, um, they will get tax credits to help pay for insurance. So the basic idea is that their insurance will not cost them more than 8 to 10 percent of their uh, gross annual income after 2014. And that's how it'll, uh, the Affordable Care Act will help make uh, coverage more affordable. There's going to be four levels of coverage, a bronze, silver, gold, and platinum, and each of those levels is going to provide good insurance. They're all going to have to uh, comply with the protections in the Patient's Bill of Rights, and, uh, and it's going to be easy to compare between plans. Now it's almost like you have to be an attorney to compare health plans to get something you want. In 2014, through the exchange, you're going to be actually be able to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges because all of these plans are going to be uh, standardized. So uh, again, in summary, the Affordable Care Act expands coverage, uh, provides new benefits, uh, consumer protections, and uh, more choices, and it makes health care more affordable. Now, uh, briefly, uh, Florida is not currently implementing the, the Affordable Care Act. They're leading a multi-stage legal challenge um, uh, to contest the constitutionality of the individual mandate. They have uh, passed a joint resolution to outlaw the minimum uh, coverage requirement, which states can't do because of the supremacy clause and in the Constitution, but you know, never mind that. Uh, they've halted all implementation activities. They've declined to enforce protections uh, and monitor compliance, and they've requested that they phase in this medical loss ratio requirement over time, rather than making sure insurance companies pay uh, everything up front. They've turned down about seventy million dollars altogether for various uh, projects that could go to help people, 
And uh, basically Florida is behind uh, the curve and it does not look like Florida is going to be ready to implement the Affordable Care Act in 2014. And I'd be happy to uh, talk with you more about that uh, later on. The best place to get information is uh, healthcare.gov. Uh, all your information on Affordable Care Act. There's a Spanish language version, cuidadodesalud.gov. And uh, our website is www.floridachain.org. And please uh, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And I've got my card here and a sign-up sheet in case you want more information. Thank you very much. Okay, my name is Jill Gass, and I am the executive director of We Care Manatee. We Care Manatee is a service uh, for the community for adults who are ages 18 to 64 who are uninsured and who are below 200% of the federal poverty line. As Patrick mentioned, uh, currently Medicaid does not cover um, adults without children, and since our patient, is, our average patient is between the ages of 40 and 55, and they are often single, and either the children are out of the home or they never did have children. Most of our patients are male, which I think is surprising to a lot of people. And um, they all are coming to us having not been to the doctor since more or less they lived with their parents. So we have a lot of patients that come to us and by the time they find us, they're quite sick. So uh, what our program was set up to do was um, coordinate with the Manatee County Medical Society to find volunteer physicians who are willing to see patients free of charge in their private offices um, on a completely pro, no, pro bono basis. Um, currently, we have about 80 physicians in the area that, that do this for us, um, and we see about 1,000 patients per year. Um, that's the, that is the most, the monster's coming. Um, <laughs> that is the most that um, over the past few years, the program was started in 99, started seeing patients in 2001. Um, we have saved the community around $2 million um, in providing free care. Uh, comprehensively with uh, medical supplies, surgical centers, um, pharmacy um, services, we have saved about $4 million. So we're a small program. We operate on less than $200,000 a year. And like I said, we serve the population that, um, that we spoke about earlier um, that's kind of being left um, and falling through the cracks. Medicaid is something that I think a lot of people believe takes care of this population, but currently they do not. Um, just as a side note, um, a lot of the pictures that you had listed there, I don't know if that really was Patrick or, or those people, but um, I, when I was 29 years old, um, I was a marathon runner for a number of years, and um, I tried to get, I thought, well, I'm going to be a grown-up now, and I'm going to go and apply for life insurance and private health insurance, because it's very expensive for We Care Manatee to provide myself, a one-person company, um, health insurance. And I was denied by every single company that um, wrote insurance policies because I had high triglycerides. I didn't know I had high triglycerides, and I was a 29-year-old marathon runner, so I can't wait for 2014 because I will finally, I, don't, I wasn't even offered a policy that said if you pay $2,000 a month you can have it. I was just denied flat out, appeal after appeal, letter from my doctor after letter from my doctor. I was, I was not allowed to receive um, life insurance, private health insurance, or um, disability, any sort of disability coverage. So I'm looking forward to the Affordable Care Act being enacted. Um, I handed out a few different brochures here um, for We Care. Inside, there's a, um, just some quick facts about our program. 100% of our patients are uninsured. 100% of them gross less than $1,800 a month. Most of our people do work. Um, they, they do cash jobs or they work a number of part-time jobs and by default they just are not offered health insurance or they have pre-existing conditions and cannot be offered health insurance. Um, as I mentioned, our typical patient is about 50 years old, and on average, each patient that receives care through our program receives about $700 worth of free medical services. Um, on the inside, there's two um, inserts. One talks a little bit about where our money comes from and how we spend it, and the other one is just a general flyer. So if you know someone who needs us, this is what you can give them. Um, and they can contact us. We have it both in English and Spanish. Um, 
the three programs, the three major programs that we offer is one, um, a specialty physician program, where what that means is a patient is either re worked up in a private um, primary care office, uh, they can be worked up in the emergency room, or they can be currently being treated by a specialist, um, and the specialist can refer them or the doctor can refer them to our program, say they need to see a dermatologist and they have you know, kind of a funny mole on their hand or on their face. Uh, through our program, they can see that dermatologist completely free of charge, and any services that are provided um, to them would be donated to them through our program. We also have a free clinic program that operates on the third Saturday of each month. We actually have a nice agreement with the One Stop Center, which is the Bill Galvano One Stop which is across the street from McKetney Baseball Field. We use their clinic when they're closed on the weekends. And we see about 20 to 25 patients for primary care reasons um, on a monthly basis. This weekend, we are actually offering free flu shots until they're gone. So if anyone um, ages 18 to 64 that is low income, if you know someone in that category and they want a flu shot, just have them stop in. And we are there from 9 a.m. till noon. Then in um, conjunction with both of those programs, we have the pharmaceutical program. So say a clinic patient is diabetic and can't afford his insulin. We offer a voucher uh, program where they can go to Walmart and basically Walmart bills us and we pay for that. Uh, they do have to be an active we care patient to receive those services. Um, and we also play for things like Plavix and you know some of those expensive medications that um, anybody who's going to see a cardiologist might need. Um, I did pass out a flyer as well. We're doing free head and neck screenings, and this is for anyone, not just if you're uninsured. Um, it's gonna be December 7th, and it's in conjunction with the Manatee Cancer Center. So if you are interested in something like that, you can, ref um, we recently had a patient who um, came to us and he did have a head ca uh, cancer. He had a really large lesion on his face, turned out to be cancer. The story is actually going to be covered tomorrow in the Bradenton Herald, but that's where this came from. They um, said there's, this was completely preventable. We didn't need this to happen. He didn't need to have all of this surgery and radiation and all of that. So they decided to do this for us for the community. And I think it's going to be a really um, nice way to reach out to the community, tell them that we're there, and, uh, and show that we're, we're really trying to solve this problem without government intervention and that this, this program is proven to have worked and um, you know, does work for 1,000 people each year in our community. So thank you for your time. Uh, again, I'm Jonathan Fleece. I'm actually a local uh, health care attorney and business law attorney with the law firm of Blaylock Walters. Uh, we've been in this community since the 1920s, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me here uh, today. I'm also a, a prior board member of the We Care Manatee organization, and I'll tell you, that is one of the most um, important organizations uh, from a healthcare perspective that we have in our community. Um, all of the physicians on the We Care uh, system volunteer their time uh, to really help those that are falling between the cracks. And as the data shows that you heard from the other speakers, we do have a lot of uh, manate manatee citizens that are falling between the cracks. Uh, so it's a great, great organization and ask your physician if they're participating in the We Care program the next time you go to a specialist. And if they are, give them a, a special thank you for um, being such great leaders uh, in our community. So I'm also, besides a lawyer with Blaylock Walters, um, a new author of uh, The New Health Age, uh, The Future of Healthcare in America. Uh, that will be available by Thanksgiving uh, through ebook for those of you who have Kindles and, and Amazon, and then in print um, by Christmas. Although I do have some special copies uh, that I'll be signing for those that may be interested uh, after today's presentation, um, uh, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. So why did I write the book? I'm a proud but concerned American. Um, we are right now in a defining moment within our country, and health care is one of the major issues that's defining our future as we head into the 20th century. Yet we're, in many cases, a divided nation. And that old saying, uh, united we stand, divided we fall, I think is telling. Because when you look at our history as a country, 
we've been through many, many challenges before. And as a proud American, it's time that we unite and that we move through some of these challenges, just like we did uh, during the Civil War era, just like we did during World War II, just like we did during World War I, um, Korea, Vietnam, uh, the Gulf War. It, this is a crisis in America. You've heard some of the uh, statistics, and I'll go through some more. And, and we really do need to be a united nation um, coming together to solve uh, the health care issues in this country. So what are some of the specifics that we found uh, during the research and, and writing of this book? Um, we, David Houle and I, who I'll talk about in a minute, my, my co-author, interviewed hundreds of uh, CEOs of hospitals, healthcare systems, businesses, um, community leaders, uh, politicians, and found some, some core issues that were a theme on a national basis. One is when you look at our healthcare delivery system today, right now it's really full of chaos, fear, and misinformation. And whenever you're talking about a topic, that's full of chaos, fear, and misinformation. It's not a productive conversation. So our goal with the book was to really take all of this chaos, fear, and misinformation that's out there and try to boil it down into uh, research data to really make and help Americans, including me, more informed about the healthcare um, crisis that we have in America and what to do about it and where we're headed as a nation uh, in the future. I'm very concerned about America's economy and our global competitiveness. Uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist for those of us in the room to read the statistics and to know that we are living through the Great Recession. Um, it's been one of the most transformational economic periods since the Great Depression, and most of us in this room feel it either directly or indirectly through a loved one, a neighbor, or other community. So why are we in this uh, economic condition and, and perhaps how much is healthcare contributing to that? I'm also concerned about our global competitiveness. One topic that David and I talk a great deal about in the book is that we are no longer an island. We are part of a global economy. Uh, jobs today uh, are being outsourced to China, India, Latin America, uh, and other parts of the world and our American businesses are having to compete against um, many, many nations across the world. And that global com competitiveness and that global competition is a huge issue. So those are, are all factors that are contributing to what's sort of driving our need to, to look at and address healthcare. So I teamed up with a futurist. Uh, I'm sort of the healthcare expert and I decided that one of the best ways to, to really figure this out and talk towards the 21st century is to talk to a futurist. So I, I teamed up with David Houle. Uh, he's an international futurist. He has uh, operations out of Chicago and out of Sarasota. Um, you can see a list of some of the things that David's been involved in over his career. He was one of the founding uh, team members of, uh, C of MTV, uh, CNN, Nickelodeon, and many other organizations. So David's really always had an ability to step out of the moment today and look towards the future to really see where we're going, why we're going in this direction, and to help people figure that out. And what's unbelievable sort of about the relationship that we've developed is that most of us, me included, live in today and make decisions based on our life experiences and things that have happened in the past. It's so hard sometimes to really step up out of our, our chairs, look at things differently, and ask how can things operate differently um, in a new world. And, and that's part of, of what David brought to the book to really help us vision and see the future of, of healthcare in America, where we've been, where we are today, and why we're, we're going uh, the direction that we're going tomorrow. So after writing the book and researching and talking to all these leaders across this country, um, what did I find? I found hope. I found hope that yes, today is very difficult. I found hope that this is a transformational time and transformations are, are, never, are never easy. But I found hope that the core soul of Americans, the core of who we are as a country, wants us to be one of the greatest countries on earth, and that we are going to work through this transformational time 
and unite and be a greater nation because of it as we move towards the new health age, uh, the 21st century model for healthcare in America. Today, healthcare spending is out of control. Uh, we spend close to 18% of our gross domestic product on healthcare in America. That is without a doubt, when you look at the world research, the highest percentage of, DD, of GDP spending for developed nations in the United States. When we talked to American businesses, CEOs uh, of large companies, owners of small companies, on average, American businesses are spending $12,000 per year on health care insurance. And when you go back and look at, at the slide I presented and, and the, uh, the concepts regarding our global uh, competitiveness and our global economy, we are competing against countries that do not spend that kind of amount of money on health care, and it's keeping us from being as competitive as we were in the 20th century in the new 21st century world. So our health care spending is out of control. Now, the next question to ask is, well, what are we getting for our spending? Unfortunately, we're not healthy. In the United States, nearly two-thirds of Americans are overweight. One-third of Americans are clinically obese. Only 25% of Americans regularly engage in physical activity. And when you look at the chronic diseases that are impacting Americans, we are not healthy as a nation. When you look at the spending on healthcare dollars in America, one of the most telling statistics that we found in the book, and we teamed up with one of the national leaders uh, in public policy, St. Louis University uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, both their law school and their public uh, health school, all of this data was confirmed over and over and over by all the research. 10% of Americans are costing us 70% of the healthcare spending. And most of that 10% group of Americans are suffering from chronic diseases. And most of those chronic diseases, when you look at the, the highest category in spending, are related to heart disease, um, pulmonary problems, clinical depression, uh, and those major chronic diseases that are, that are impacting Americans. So we're spending more than, than every other developed nation in the world but we're not one of the healthiest nations. So something obviously is not working when you look at the macro perspective of our healthcare um, system in America. We've all been to the doctor, we've all been to the hospital, and when you ask yourself, is it an enjoyable experience, um, many people say that it's not. Um, we function in silos. You may visit your primary care physician today who refers you to a specialist next week, and you go to the specialist next week, and that specialist, A, doesn't have your medical records, B, sometimes um, asks that you take the same diagnostic test again, you have to fill out the same paperwork, and many times those two uh, physicians are not um, communicating or really coordinating um, the care. I touched on medical records. Um, when you go to the bank, you can go to, uh, let's say, Bank of America's downtown Bradenton branch, travel out to West Manatee, go down to Sarasota, or even get on an airplane and see your loved ones in another state, walk into a Bank of America branch and take out your money and get your information about your banking. You can't do that within healthcare today, for, for the most part. Our medical records are siloed, they're, they're not communicating, they're not shareable. Uh, which is costing many, many, many um, medical errors and issues in the country. And then when you think about the experience, the average wait time today in emergency rooms is pushing four hours. So ask yourself in healthcare if the average wait time to go to our emergency room is four hours, what other part of American economy do you accept that? When you're checking into a hotel uh, to go on vacation, how many of you would, would be pleased with having to wait in a check-in line for four hours to get your hotel room? So something obviously when we look at the American healthcare delivery system is, is, is broken. So how major is this transformation that we're experiencing? We think that it is as significant and as major as the changes that occurred in transportation from when the American transportation system was based in the horse and buggy world to when Henry Ford uh, hit the economy. That's how major the transformations are that the new health age represent. 
our, tra our entire transportation system changed with Henry Ford and the invention of the automobile. That's what's going to happen in the 21st century as we move to the new health age. Some more recent transformations. How many of you remember the Walkman? It's amazing how fast something that we felt was so transformational became obsolete and, and over. And with the uh, iPad and the iPod um, and the iPhone, music became completely digitized. Um, I'm actually old enough or young enough, whichever your perspective is, to remember cassette tapes, eight track tapes, and think of where things have gone over my lifetime. Those transformations are going to happen just as fast in healthcare over the next 10 to 20 years. So, what is changing? How we think about healthcare is fundamentally changing to the core. In the 20th century model of healthcare, healthcare was oriented around sickness, it was oriented around being um, reactive, it was inefficient. In the 21st century model, healthcare is going to be about prevention, wellness, efficiency, and more collaboration. How we deliver healthcare is going to change. In the 20th century model, healthcare functioned in silos. We were disintegrated. We weren't collaborative. We are now integrating and delivering healthcare, moving into the 21st century in a, in a, in a much more integrated uh, manner. Now, is that happening instantaneously next week? Absolutely not. And you've got to put yourself in the David Hu world of being a futurist, that these transformations do take time. But locally here in our communities, you can look at the integration that is occurring and the, the steps that we're taking to deliver health care in more efficient ways. Um, Blake Medical Hospital locally here has acquired um, two uh, physician groups, the Pinnacle Medical Group, the Healthcare Mer Medical Group. Other physicians are coordinating and integrating more with the hospitals so that it becomes more of an integrated system so that you have communication and collaboration going on within the system. And then the economics of healthcare are going to change. Doctors in the 20th century were, for the most part, paid to treat sickness. They had no motivation to pay to keep people well and to try to prevent diseases. New models, some of them under the Affordable Care Act and many, many others that are being driven by American businesses, are going to pay doctors in the 21st century to prevent disease, to keep people well, to keep patients out of the hospital, and to truly move into a world of health. And there are physicians in Manatee County today that are actually working under pilot programs within the Medicare plan that are doing exactly that. This applies to all ages. Regardless of your age, regardless of your clinical condition, being proactive, being engaged, creating a medical home environment can truly help people that are suffering from chronic diseases get those chronic diseases under control. And when you look at the cost curve and the benefits of a world of wellness, it is staggering because, again, 10% in this room are costing 70% of the dollars. Once we figure out and work with those 10% that have the most acute and chronic health care conditions to bring down um, the spending and to move you towards more of a health wellness environment, it is phenomenal the savings that can occur on both the taxpayer side as well as um, on the business side. And then finally, before we open this up for questions, um, it's time to talk about death and dying in America. I am a proud member of the Tidewell Hospice Board of Directors, and for many of you who know, Tidewell Hospice serves Manatee, Sarasota, Charlotte, and DeSoto counties. It is one of the most incredible organizations that I've ever been involved with in my life. And when we look at the concept of death and dying, 80% of us, me including, want to die at home when that day comes. But 80% of Americans today don't die at home, despite that being their wishes. They die in an ICU at anywhere from ten dollars to $20,000 a day in an environment that's institutional where their loved ones and their family members and their spiritual leaders are not with them. And it's also costing 40% of the Medicare budget in the last 30 days of life. So something's not right there. If we're dying in an environment where we don't want to be, and it's costing 40 days of the Medicare budget in the last 30 days of people's lives, we need to have a discussion. And, and Tidewell Hospice is just one organization that is in our community trying to have that discussion every day. 
And not only is it a future that will allow us to all pass and die in a way that, that we want to, but it's also a way that will help preserve the economic integrity of the country and for our children and for our, 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 our grandchildren. The race to a healthy America. That is the call to action that David Hool and I end the book with. And we are starting the race to a healthy America in Florida. Um, the race to the moon started on the East Coast. The race to a healthy America is going to start on the West Coast. Uh, we've teamed up with an organization in Tampa. It's the Tampa Bay Partnership. It's one of the largest um, policy maker economic uh, development organizations in our region. We're going to launch it at the Tampa Bay Convention Center on February 24th of 2012. And we as a region are going to make this community one of the healthiest communities in America. And we're going to start the race to a healthy America in the Tampa Bay region. Uh, we're kicking around a lot of different ideas about what we're going to do, but we are all invited to participate. Um, we think what we may try to do is to literally walk the distance to the moon in a certain period of time as a region. Um, the distance from the Earth to the moon is about 238,000 miles, give or take. And when you add all the counties up together in Tampa, that's about 17 miles per person when you add all of the, the people up. Now, for those that aren't going to walk the full 17, you know, of course, I'll volunteer to, to walk more than that. But we really think as a region that we can do that and set a model for the country as we move into a new era that focuses on activity, uh, diet, nutrition, and eating healthy, uh, ingenuity uh, through technology, and innovation. Uh, I want to leave time for questions, but I'm just going to give you one example of, of the innovation that's coming in the 21st century. It's called nanotechnology. The concept of nanotechnology is that these nano cells will be filled with gold, injected into our bodies, and seek out cancer tumors. Once the first nano finds the cancer tumor, it will send out a signal to all the other nanos that have been injected into our body, and all these nanos will circle, will circle around the tumor at once. And then when they're all circled around the tumor, um, they will be heated up to a certain degree of heat that it will not allow the cells to keep reproducing. It will actually kill the tumor. So the day is coming in the United States, and it is not too far away. Well, some cancers will not need chemo. Some cancers will not need radiation. All you will need to basically cure cancer is a shot of nanos. That's part of the 21st century model, and that's part of our future. It's time for questions now. Uh, please state your uh, name and uh, use the microphone there to ask your question. And you may direct your question either to one member of the panel or to as many as you'd like. My name is Alice Nolan, and uh, my question is to our first speaker. Um, Florida is not ready for the implementation of the new plan uh, for 2014. Um, and also, my daughter who lives in Ohio says that her state has chosen to opt out and not enact any of the provisions for, say, pre-existing condition or children staying on their plan until they're 25. Are there any enforcement provisions or any way that this will resolve itself so that the legislation will be enacted in a timely basis or close to a timely basis? Uh, okay, Alice uh, uh, was asking about how Florida is not implementing the Affordable Care Act and is not enforcing uh, any of the provisions and uh, other states like Ohio are, are Doing similar, uh, doing similar things, not taking action. And Alice has a great question. Uh, we don't really know what's going to happen in 2014. If Florida does not have mechanisms in place to implement the law, that's going to result in uh, children and families not getting the coverage that they need. And it could potentially mean that insurance companies, if they're not held accountable, because they know that there's no enforcement mechanism, they may try to get away without uh, complying with some of these uh, uh, benefits or protections like can't get canceled if you're sick or cover people with pre-existing conditions and so forth. Now, that's, that's just a, a speculative uh, uh, stance. I don't know what's going to happen then. The federal government 
will have an obligation to step in and uh, enforce the law if the state does not, but we're not really sure. And uh, from Florida Chain standpoint, what we're trying to do is we're trying to urge uh, Florida residents to speak to their uh, legislators and encourage them, urge them to do what's necessary to implement the law because there really there are lives at stake here. It's not just about health insurance, but people who won't get coverage in 2014 because Florida was dragging their feet or decide they didn't want to obey federal law, those things are actually could result in, uh, in some deaths and that would uh, really be tragic. Uh, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that uh, afterwards. Thanks, Alice. My name is Nancy Horn and my question is to you, Jonathan. In this very uh, worthy cause that you are endeavoring to have us all get out and exercise and do this type of thing, are you using this with the Affordable Care Act or are you ignoring it or do you think that Florida can do it without the Aff Affordable Care Act? What we talk about in the book for the most part is going to happen with or without the Affordable Care Act and here's why. Um, but I'm going to come back and talk about the timing piece. Um, American businesses told us over and over and over again in the one plus years of research that we did that we cannot continue to function and be competitive as an economy under the current health care system. And the current health care system focusing on, again, sickness, being reactive, not being proactive, not being um, efficient is what's driving our GDP spending to close to 18% of GDP, but yet we're not getting the health outcomes that we need. So the reason that we believe that regardless of the Affordable Care Act, that, that much of what we talk about in my presentation in the book will happen is because American business is driving it. And I'm gonna give you a great example, and actually it's not even business, it's thanks to uh, our Commissioner Carol Whitmore who was here and our, our uh, county health plan any employee that works for Manatee County today lives in the 21st century health model. They have a health plan that focuses on prevention, um, anti-smoking, exercise, um, losing weight, to be proactive, to be preventative, and to keep those health care costs down. So business and local governments through their own health plans are gonna ultimately drive all this change. Will these changes occur faster uh, under the Affordable Care Act? Absolutely. Because what the Affordable Care Act did for the country, regardless if you agree with it, disagree with it, agree with some of it, disagree with some of it, regardless of what you, you think about the Affordable Care Act, it, it was the legislation that put this question and put this topic and put these forums together all across America. And once you start to open your mind and open the world towards change, there are many concepts that, that can't stop it. But yes, certainly um, the, the Affordable Care Act will move some of these changes faster um, if it's ruled to be constitutional um, probably next summer, um, which I believe it probably will be, but that's a, that's a different, different topic that gets into my, my health lawyer side. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brian Hevron. My question is with the WeCare program that you currently have here in Manatee County, is there like uh, a waiting list for individuals who are trying to possibly get health care through you? Uh, I know that a lot of the programs that uh, are offered, not only statewide, federally, whatever, it seems like we have so many programs that, you know, are great ideas and such, but then when you go to try to use one of those programs, you run into a waiting list of 2,000 people or 3,000 people ahead of you and such. What type of, are we fortunate enough to have your program to where we don't have that problem? The question was about a waiting list to use our program. Once a patient is referred in, let's say when I get back to the office, there's a referral waiting for me to process. We process it usually within 24 hours of receiving it then the responsibility falls on the patient to get together the four items that we need to make them eligible for the program. One of those things is a Florida ID that is active, uh, not expired. Two proofs of residency, which can just be an electric bill, water bill, something like that that matches the address on your ID. 
You need to prove how you're living. So if you're working, we need pay stubs from the last four weeks. Or if you're being supported by someone, they just write a letter that says, I, Jill, support you at $300 a month, and that provides X, Y, Z. And then if they have a bank statement, we just need to attach that. That process, some people it will take a week or two to get that together. But once they become eligible, we try to get them an appointment within that same month. So our, our wait list, um, the longest wait list, wait list is for cardiology, and that is just because we have everyone who needs to see a cardiologist, and we only have a few that volunteer. So the more physicians that we have in, um, we're able to turn patients over faster. But on average, a patient waits about two weeks. I heard that you were on the board of Tidewell Hospice, which I think is a wonderful organization. Um, and I also heard you, t oh, I also wanted to mention, I hope that you interviewed nurses and nurse practitioners for your book or talked to nurses and nurse practitioners. I, I didn't hear you say that. You said uh, about physicians, but nurses and nurse practitioners are, are a big, huge part of health care. Um, the thing that I found with hospice, which I think is really sad, is that patients do want to die at home, but sometimes the families are not comfortable with them being at home. And so they end up in a skilled nursing facility. And because it's a skilled nursing facility and because um, the, uh, the way that Medicare works, Medicare will only pay for the patients to be there for 100 days, 21 days, 100%, and then 80% for 100 days, the patients have to go through like an exercise program, a rehab. And so these patients that are dying and are, they're really weak, they're having to go through exercising because of rules that CMS or Medicare has. So the two questions were, one, um, in the new health age, do David and I talk about uh, nurse practitioners and the role that nurse practitioners and other allied health professionals will play? That's question one. And then question two is, is how um, in the hospice world um, can hospice help people that may not want to die at home but may want to have a little bit more help either in a skilled nursing facility or an assisted living facility or, or, or other type of institutional environment. Um, to answer your first question, absolutely um, all allied health professionals, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and, and others, in fact, the University of South Florida has one of the first doctors of nursing programs in the United States are going to be vitally important in, in the 21st century model because, well, number one, we don't have enough physicians um, to provide as much of the preventative care and to create this new concept called a medical home that many of you may have read about. And then, frankly, there's a lot of health care that doesn't demand a physician's time. You know, certainly physicians have to be coordinating care and coming up with clinical disease management protocols and, and be the ultimate um, quarterback for the football fans in the room. Um, but, but they absolutely need nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and other allied health professionals to be involved in that process. So it's a huge role um, going, going forward. In fact, there was a great article, I think it was in the New York Times maybe over the weekend, about case management and the roles of nurses uh, within a pilot program uh, that Maryland is, is, is moving forward with to really try to create that medical home for, uh, for Maryland citizens. Then the next question was what can hospice do um, for in situations where families don't want their loved ones to be um, in a, at home when they die, they'd rather be in more of an institutional environment. I think number one um, is that we need to be having more frank discussions as families. I'm 44 years old, my parents just turned 70, and thanks to the book and thanks to being part of hospice and, and, and what I now know, um, I am sitting down with my parent, parents today. I mean, not literally today, but in, in the next several months, my, my um, brothers and sisters are gonna be here for Thanksgiving, and we are going to have open, honest dialogue about understanding what they really want. Because oftentimes, I think, speaking now from the child's perspective at 44 years old, you know, it's heartbreaking to think of the day that my parents will die. But we're all going to die. And oftentimes, I think the tension that comes up in your question is that 
children want to do everything possibly um, that, that's out there to, 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 to get you know, as many moments as you possibly can when in fact maybe that's not what, what our parents want. So challenge one is to just have that dialogue. But if it is a situation where truly the, the, the patient is better off in an institutional environment, your question went to how do these reimbursement rules work? And without a doubt, there are some crazy reimbursement rules under Medicare and what hospice can cover and what hospice can't. But what I can at least tell you about your local hospice in Manatee, Sarasota, Charlotte, and DeSoto Kent County is that our case management team will do everything we can possibly do to make sure that we're following through with the family's desires um, towards the end of life. And studies show, study after study, that the earlier you get into a hospice program, the longer you live. Too many people wait too long to get into a hospice program, um, but the earlier you get in, the longer you live, because that's what the, the hospice mission is all about, is to try to really help during those, those, you know, those last um, several months. And, and many patients actually come into a hospice program, we give them such great care that other caregivers aren't used to giving that they actually get discharged from hospice because they no longer qualify. They're no longer within the six month of, of um, possible death. So, but your question is, is, is very spot on and I just challenge you to have those discussions with your doctors, with the patients, with the family members and with hospice to really try to reach that, that complete plan. And sorry, that's all the time we have for questions, but hopefully the speakers will stay for a while after the program and you can ask your questions. Uh, thank you very much for coming today. I think this has been an excellent program. We thank our excellent speakers for giving us so much information. And what do you do with this information? Well, you contact your representatives in Congress and the state so that um, you can express your views on what they should do regarding decision making on health care. Be an active citizen. They do respond if they hear from enough of you. And. Um, we want to thank uh, a number of people. We want to thank the Bradenton Women's Club for the use of their hall. We want to thank METV for taping our program for later showing, which you can watch on METVweb.com. You can watch it on your television lot when they show the program, or you can watch it on your computer by clicking on their YouTube link. We also invite you to join the league and become active. We do a lot of work and we could use some help. So please consider joining. And um, that's all I have. We won't have a program in December, but we'll be back in January. Thank you all again so much for coming and thanks again.